Well, we want to welcome you. My name is Danny Barra. I'm the lead pastor at Cambridge City Christian Church. And we're continuing on our series, The Story, by looking at week number 22. And this week, we're going to take a look at um, the birth of Jesus Christ. I don't know if you've stopped and taken a look at some of the artwork that's been created. I know that we've got a lot of talented artists in our church. Over these, these first 21 weeks, we've really seen the artistry in our people come out. We've seen pictures from some of our uh, Old Testament lessons, like from, um, from Esther and uh, from the Garden of Eden, the very first uh, lesson of the story. And you can see one here behind me that we had last week that come from uh, Nehemiah. So we've, we've been really, really blessed to uh, see some of the artistic talent come out in our church. And so I thought, you know what, I really want to join in on this art extravaganza, okay? So I thought to myself, you know what, I'm going to draw this great picture because we didn't really have one lined up for this week. And I thought, I'm going to draw a picture of the birth of Jesus. So this past week, I drew the picture and I went across in our offices over to where Levi was. I said, Levi, I've got this picture that I want us to put up. And he's like, oh, okay. And so I pulled it out and I pulled out my masterpiece of Jesus lying in a manger and I, and, but for some reason, he will not let me hang this up. Can you believe that? I mean, he will not let me put this up with all of the, well, I, well, okay. Maybe, maybe I could see why he wouldn't want me to put it up, because that is the limit of my art creativity. I cannot draw worth a lick. But I'll tell you, we're blessed at our church to have a lot of people who can draw, and they've done a wonderful job in bringing out the story. Well, like I've already said, we've spent these last 21 weeks looking at the Old Testament, and we followed the journey of the Jewish people. We've seen throughout the story of the Old Testament, constantly woven throughout the story, the promise of a Messiah, the promise of a coming king who would save them. And we've also seen over the first 21 weeks of the story that God has, he has stuck with his people Israel, even through their ups and through their downs. We, we've seen so many times when the Israelites didn't learn a lesson or they just didn't want to listen to God. And, and so we know that through that Old Testament story, finally we came to Nehemiah last week where he um, led in the reconstruction of the walls. We know that other leaders such as Ezra came and helped reconstruct the temple. We also know about people like Malachi, great prophets who promised of this coming king. But following Malachi, there was over 400 years of silence. There was nothing from the time of Malachi until the arrival of Jesus Christ. And so today what we, what we remember is the Christmas story. Now it might seem kind of weird. Here it is, the very beginning of March, and we're going to talk about the Christmas story. But yes, that's what we're talking about. Because it is right here in this story that the entire um, that, that history is hung, it, it's hinged. You know, we're moving from the Old Testament into the New Testament. And the Christmas story is, is to show us that God truly does deliver on his promises. And we see that woven throughout this story, both in the Old Testament and now as we enter into the New Testament, that God has written a story of reconciliation about how he is trying to restore our relationship with him. But the thing is, is that when Jesus came, there were a lot of people who missed out on him. Even though Jesus had been predicted, even though he had been promised, even though he had been prophesied about, there were a lot of people that missed out on him. You know, I, when I was thinking about this and thinking of the people in that time that missed out on Jesus, I thought, have I ever made my mind up about something or someone before really taking a look at the facts? I mean, we see this a lot in politics. I bet you've done this. You've decided beforehand how you are going to decide on it. Um, you, maybe it's from your upbringing. Maybe it's from things you've read. Maybe it's just your mindset. You make a decision before really looking at the facts and making a well-rounded decision. We see this even in our families. So many times in our families, we think, hey, I know exactly how sh something should be done. And so you go into a situation, and you think, this is how it should be done. And then often we'll see it leads to more problems. And, and maybe even sometimes we miss out on what the real problem even is. I mean, maybe you even do this at work. Maybe your boss makes a decision and you've just decided before he's, he or she's even presented the facts that you're against it. You won't even listen to it. You've made these preconceptions about something. And we even do it with people. 
Maybe we'll walk into a grocery store and we'll see someone dressed a certain way or acting a certain way and we think to ourselves, well, that person must be this or they must have done that. And so we make these these. Um, preconceptions about people that aren't healthy. And that's what the leaders did in, um, in, in Jesus' time. When they saw Jesus arrive, they just, many of them just could not accept that Jesus was the Messiah. You know, I know even in my own life, I've made preconceptions off and on. Um, I've shared the story a, a little bit before, but, but probably the worst preconception I've ever made of someone was of a guy that would become my best friend in high school. His name was Roger, and you know, Roger was different. Now, you have to, you have to understand, I, um, where I grew up in, in Okeechobee, Florida, I was not, most people, let me say this, most people in Okeechobee were what many would consider, I, I'm, I'm just going to say cowboys, all right? And so everybody wore their Wrangler jeans and their boots and, 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 the, and the clothes that you, know, you would wear, I guess, if you're a cowboy. And, and I wasn't a cowboy. I lived in town. I never lived on a farm. I never had these uh, connections uh, with agriculture a whole lot. And so this friend of mine that, who would become a friend of mine, Roger, comes in the first day of school. And, and I'm sitting in algebra class, and he walks in, and, and he's wearing the boots and the jeans and all that. Now, he wasn't from our town, but he was from another agricultural town. And so I look at him, I'm like, okay, he's a cowboy. I'm not. I don't hang out with cowboys. I do my own thing. So, so anyway, as time goes along, I, I eventually become friends with Roger. But the problem was I had made these misconceptions, these preconceptions about him, and it kept me from really discovering who he was as a person. And so probably, I, I'm, I would say probably six months I went sitting by him, but just kind of avoiding him because I thought, hey, he's not like me. I don't want to get to know him. And so I, I look back now and I realize I missed out on six months of a friendship that I could have experienced if I'd have just gone into it with open eyes rather than with preconceptions. And the thing is, is that they did that to Jesus. And so often we too, we're not interested in listening to the facts, but we're more interested in reinforcing our own opinions. That, that's often what, what happens. And so as Jesus comes on the scene, the people have already created what they think a Messiah should look like. They think that a Messiah should be a political leader. They think the Messiah should be someone who's going to come in and push Rome out of uh, authority there in Judea. They thought that this Messiah would be so much different than the Jesus that we know of. And so there's, there's some other things, too, that, that they, some other preconceptions they have made. They thought, well, surely Jesus, or surely the Messiah, would never be born to peasants. But that's who Jesus was born to. He was born to peasants, Mary and Joseph, very poor people. They, they would have never thought that Jesus would be born in a town, or, or excuse me, that he would live in a town called Nazareth. You know, that why would he want to live there? I mean, his own, his own hometown, this was a town where the people there even tried to throw him off a cliff. They, they just couldn't accept that the King of kings and the Lord of lords would live there in their midst. And so when Matthew, when we read in the book of Matthew, where it writes of the Christmas story, he writes the Christmas story to a Jewish audience. He's trying to convince them. He's trying to tell them, hey, this Jesus, he is the Messiah, but he's not the Messiah like you thought he would be. And so what he does is he starts off this entire argument by showing some historical fact that's also intertwined with the reality of where he's at and how he was born in the, in the station he was born into. If you look in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, we read that, that he writes this. He says, This is the genealogy, genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now we have to re realize something. Genealogy was extremely important to the Jews. Extremely important to him. Now today, of course, there's, it's kind of gotten more popular. You can go to like websites, right, Ancestry.com, and, and some of these websites and track down your ancestry. But back then, genealogy was an even bigger part because usually, not always, but usually what would happen is your genealogy, the, the line that you came through, said something about your station in the world, or at least in that part of the world. And so if you were born of the priestly uh, clans or the tribe from the priestly tribe or from the priestly families, I should say, then that would probably be what your job is. Or, so, so genealogy was really important. So that's exactly why Matthew starts out, by trying to argue the lineage that Jesus had come from. And we'll, we'll get back to that here in just a little bit. So, so we have Mar Matthew, and then, of course, we know that the next gospel is Mark. And Mark, it's interesting, if you read the book of Mark, Mark doesn't even talk about Jesus' birth. 
There's no mention. He just jumps right into um, he just jumps right into Jesus' life and ministry. So it's very interesting that he doesn't get into the birth, and there's a reason why for that. The reason why is because <clears throat> Mark, his letter was more toward the Greeks, more toward those whose genealogy, yeah, it was a good thing, but it wasn't as important to the Jews. So his audience, he had a different mindset as he's sharing about Jesus. And then that brings us to Luke. And the book of Luke is really interesting, and, and most people don't realize this, but the book of Luke is actually a book of two books. And what I mean is, is that you have the book of Luke and then you have the book of Acts. The book of Luke and Acts were originally more than likely one, one big book that wrote about the life of Jesus and then the early church. So Luke was very um, detail-oriented. Luke was a physician. And so he writes in, in Luke 1, 3, he says, With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you. I mean, that sounds like something a doctor would say, right? I'm going to write an orderly account for you. Well, I've investigated this. <clears throat> he does it from a very intellectual-based um, approach, which is important because it gives us a different viewpoint of Jesus and his ministry. And then, of course, we read about John. Uh, we read the book of John. And the book of John is, I would say the book of John is kind of like looking uh, at, a book, at Jesus' life from a 10,000-foot view. He's kind of looking from above at Jesus and what he does. And it's very interesting as you read the book. It's very poetic. It's a very poetic book in a lot of ways. And so John kind of brings a little bit of the emotion to the story. And understandably so, because John was one of Jesus' closest disciples and friends. And so he writes in John 1, 1 to 2, here's what he says. He says, in the beginning was the Word. So again, he's, he's taking a look back. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. So, so when you hear him write that in those first two verses of John, we very easily see that it, sound, it sounds like the creation account, doesn't it? You know, in the beginning was the Word. Jesus was there. John wants the people to know, as they're reading his book, he wants them to know that Jesus, his life did not begin in Bethlehem, that it had, it had always been there, that he is God. Jesus is eternal. Actually, if you look at the very next verse, in verse 3, it says that through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. So in other words, Jesus was the word, uh, the Greek term, the logos. He was the word, the fulfillment of all that God had given throughout the Old Testament and now as we enter into the New. Now, as we go further here today, um, most of us, I think, are familiar with the account of Jesus' birth in, in Matthew. And that's what I'm going to read here. I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. And here's what it says. It says, This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. And because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to, divor to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins." And then in verse 24 it says, When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. The most wonderful name of all, right? You know, I want to look at three things here with you today that I think we've seen throughout the story and we see yet again here in this story, in the story, the greatest story ever told, the, the arrival of the Messiah. And the first thing I want you to look at is this, is that first, God uses people. I mean, over and over again throughout the story, we have seen God use people. And here we see again that God decides that he's going to use two very simple people, Mary and Joseph. And it's interesting that over and over again throughout the story, God uses the people that he chooses to use, right? I mean, does he really have to have people to accomplish his story? Well, I guess not. He's God, right? He could just, he could just tell us it. He could write it in a book and hand it out. But he doesn't. He uses people. God uses people. And we see in this story that he uses a virgin girl and her husband-to-be to bring into this world our Savior. 
And really, as we look at these two, how they've reacted to God and how they've listened to God, they really are true heroes of the faith, aren't they? They're, they're great heroes of the faith. But now we see the arrival of Jesus, who is the hero himself. He is the hero of all heroes. And, and I shared some time back, and this is something I think you have to remember as we're looking at this, but I shared some time back that the Bible has three phases. There are three phases in the Bible. First, we have the Old Testament, and the Old Testament is trying to tell us that Jesus is coming. He's on the way. We need a Savior, and he's on the way. And now we enter into the Gospels, and the Gospels say that Jesus is here. Here is the hope we've been looking for. Here is the Messiah. He is here. And then later on, as we'll, we'll be getting into in the next few weeks, is there's the rest of the New Testament. And the rest of the New Testament is saying that Jesus is coming again. And so here it is. It's saying Jesus is here, the Gospels. And it all starts with a baby boy. On a silent night, God enters into the world. I mean, think about this for a second. The voice that spoke the world into existence. The, the voice that whispered to Elijah as he, was standing outside of a, as he was standing outside of a cave, as he was afraid that God whispered him to him. The, the voice that thundered from Mount Sinai when Moses was on that mountain was now in a baby. He was just cooing and gurgling. I mean, it's, it's really quite amazing that God would lower himself, but that's exactly what he did. He lowered himself to be among us. The word became flesh, flesh. And the word dwelt among us in a feeding trough of all places. God uses people. Secondly, we know that God has a plan. His plan was to give us a gift in a person. The gift of salvation. And that gift originated in God's plan. God decided that he was going to give us a gift that we don't deserve. And he was going to give us a gift that no one else could. Because no one else can give us the gift of salvation. Only God can do that. Only God can give us Jesus, and only Jesus can forgive us. In 2 Corinthians 9.15, I think Paul kind of understands exactly what I'm talking about here. He says, thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. It's such a great gift. And this, this was God's plan, was to give us this gift. But like every gift, the gift came at a cost. We knew that Jesus had to be born as a defenseless child, that he would have to go through temptation in his life, and yet we know he stayed sinless. And we knew that Jesus would have to die on a cross as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. This was the plan. And God's gift and God's plan, it's truly indescribable. And here's the more amazing thing, is that God gave us this plan. God gave us this, this vision for us, this future for us, even though he knew that some of us would reject it, that some would misunderstand it, some would mistake his identity. He gave, though he knew many would not give their heart back to him. And so I guess really the question would be, well, why would he do that? Why would he give us a gift without, without uh, knowing that we were going to accept it back? He did it because of his love, but he also did it for the third reason. And the third thing today I want you to realize is this, is that God keeps his promises. In Genesis, God promised the head of the serpent would be crushed by a descendant of Adam, that he would create a nation that would bless the entire world. That's what God promised. And he kept that promise in Jesus. He told Abraham that a man would come to show God's people how to live and to be their savior. God promised all of this through prophecy too. You know, if you read in 2 Peter, it says that we have the more sure word of prophecy. And, and really, I guess if you were to break prophecy down, prophecy is a prediction. Uh, and, and prophecy was a prediction that God gave to people through his leading. And then those predictions would come true. And Jesus is the ultimate prophecy, the ultimate prediction that came true. You know, over the last 21 weeks, we have seen these predictions. And now we see in Christ's arrival... The, the, the truth in those predictions. He is validating the predictions through Jesus. I don't know if you knew this, but in the Old Testament, there were over 300 prophecies. Actually, in the Old Testament, excuse me. There were over 300 prophecies about the Messiah. And there were 60 major prophecies. And the, and the most amazing thing is that Jesus fulfills them all. He fulfills all of them. I mean, and, and so here's the thing. I talked to you a few minutes ago about how there was 400 years between 
the, the last prophecies of Malachi and the birth of Jesus. And, and we might wonder, well, why was it that, that there was 400 years? Why did God have 400 years? Maybe, and I'm just throwing this out as an opinion, but maybe the reason there was 400 years between some of these prophecies and the time of Jesus is to add more weight to them, to show, you know what, this, it took 400 years that, that this wasn't just some random occurrence, that it took time for God to bring about his plan. And when you read it, some of the, the predictions, some of the prophecies that are made about Jesus are really crazy. I mean, let's just be frank, they're crazy, and yet they're true. One of the more famous ones comes from Micah chapter 5, verse 2. In Micah 5, verse 2, it says, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. So, so what he is saying is that the... the the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Now, I want you to know something. Bethlehem, at that time, do you, you know what its population was? From most estimates, the average population of Bethlehem at that time was only 1,000 people. So think about it. For a Messiah, for the entire world to be born in a town of 1,000 people. I mean, that's like three times smaller than Cambridge City. I mean, think about that. It's amazing that, that, that this would be prophesied by Malachi, and it came true. It's amazing. It's, it's really quite crazy, but true. And we read another one in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Here's what it says. It says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. Now you have to remember, when this prophecy was given by Isaiah, this was over 700 years before Mary and Joseph even came on the scene, and yet... Isaiah prophesies the arrival of a virgin, or, the, or the, uh, prophesies a virgin birth, that Jesus would be born of a woman who is a virgin. It's really quite amazing. In Matthew chapter 1, we read another one. He shares another one. He says, it says that all this, Matthew writes this, he says, all these prophecies took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. So in other words, he is saying these things took place to prove that what the prophet said was true. We see another prophecy in Isaiah chapter 53. It says this, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our inequities. <clears throat> the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Remember, this is 700 years, 700 years before Jesus was arrested and put on a cross. And yet here it is. Another prophecy. Or how about Judas' betrayal of Jesus? In Zechariah chapter 11, it talks about that. You know, if you read it on your own, it talks about these 30 pieces of silver. It's the 30 pieces of silver passage. This is 400 years before Jesus is born that it's prophesied that he would be, that he would be handed over, betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. We, we even know that Jesus' death on the cross, that it, that it was predicted. Think about this. Jesus' death on the cross was predicted 800 years before the crucifixion was ever invented. During the time of Isaiah, there was, there was no such thing as a crucifixion. That was something that was created by the Romans. It wasn't used in Israel until 63 B.C., and yet we read the psalmist, David also writes of it, when he says this. He said, A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and feet. All my bones are on dis display. People stare and gloat over me. They, they divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. 800 years before this form of death was created, here we see David prophesying it. See, I guess what I'm trying to tell you is that this is, this is, all, this is no accident. There's no accident here. It's very interesting, back about 50 or so years ago, Peter Stoner, he was a mathematician from out west in a university in California. He once did a study on the probability of Jesus just fulfilling eight, that's right, eight of these 300 prophecies, just eight of them. And he concluded this. <coughs> it's really quite amazing. He concluded that the odds of this happening with just eight prophecies, that all eight of these would fit, is this, that, that it would be 1 in 10, no, not just 1 in 10, 1 in 10 to the 17th power. Now think about that. That means 1 in 10 and then put 17 zeros behind it. That's the odds of just these eight, eight of these prophecies being fulfilled in one person. That's some amazing numbers. And I think that just, just goes to show 
that, that indeed Jesus is the Messiah and he is who God planned to send. God has given us the roadmap to, G, to the Messiah, and that is Jesus. And so we see that these prophecies are fulfilled. And many, if you remember, of these prophecies were things that he had no control over. Like, for instance, there are some prophecies that speak of, like, riding. There's a prophecy, I can't remember the exact text right now, but there's a prophecy that talks about him riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. Okay, that's something he can control. He could choose a donkey and fulfill it. But you can't choose where you're born. And that's where he was born. He was born in Bethlehem. He can't choose his ancestry. As you saw in Matthew 1, his ancestry goes all the way back to David. And, and David, of course, was promised to have, it was through that line that the Messiah would come. He didn't choose who his great, 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 great grandpa was. He didn't get to choose those things. So I think it just goes again to show that God keeps his promises. And while we might not keep our promises, that God always keeps his promises. And God always does it in the perfect timing. We see that in Galatians chapter 4. It says, But when the time, when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. So God's purpose, his purpose, was always to send Jesus, to save us. And, and yet so many people, and, and maybe it's been you, maybe you've missed it. You know, I talked to you about my friend Roger when I started off, and you might wonder, well, what was it that changed my mind about Roger? Well, you know what changed my mind about Roger and when I started talking to him and getting to know him was that there were other friends of mine that hung out with him and talked to him first. And after talking to him, they talked about how awesome he was and how he was very friendly and, and, and all these different attributes. And I heard, well, maybe he isn't so bad. And so I got to know him and we became good friends. I guess what I'm saying is that maybe, maybe you today, maybe you have had the wrong ideas about Jesus. Maybe you've preconceived notions of who he is. Maybe you've thought of Jesus as a great teacher, but not as Lord. Maybe you've thought of Jesus as a wise man, but not a savior. Maybe you've thought of Jesus as a teacher, but not your savior. But I want you to know this. Jesus is so much more than that. So much more than that. I guess what I'm asking you is not to have a case of mistaken identity like they had with Jesus. But here's the thing. You know, I may or I may not know you, but there are people around you that know Jesus, that do know you. And, and so I guess what I'm saying is don't just take my word for it. Find some people that you know, that you trust, who have a relationship with Jesus, and, and let them tell you what he's done for them in their lives. Maybe that would make a better, bigger impact on you. You know, those words that started the Christmas story, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. He is Christ the Lord. Those words to us are the beginning of the greatest story ever told, and it's the story that's changed countless lives. And it can change your life too. Hear the story from others and hear how it's changed their lives. As I close here, uh, there's, a, there's an interesting story. You may not have heard of this guy's name. The, one of the first men to walk on the moon was a guy named James Irwin. Now, now, poor James Irwin, you know, we don't really think of James Irwin a lot about somebody walking on the moon because we think of people like Neil Armstrong, right? The very first one to walk on the moon. But, but James Irwin was one of the men who walked on the moon. And James Irwin <clears throat> was a Christian man. And after his journey there, there was something interesting that he would do. He did this for the rest of his life. When he would conclude a letter, he would always conclude the letter to whomever it was that he was writing to by saying this. He would always say this. He would say, there is one thing better than man walking on the moon, and that is God walking on the earth. I, I love that statement. I'll say it again. There is one thing better than man walking on the moon, and that is God walking on the earth. And see, I think James Irwin, he understood the story. He understood what the story is about. He understood that Jesus keeps his promises, that Jesus always has, and then he always will keep those promises. And really, there's just one more thing I want to remind you of. You know, the first time that Jesus came to earth, he came as a helpless baby. He, he came as a weak baby. But I want you to know this, that when he comes the second time, the Bible tells us, 
that he's going to come in power. He's not going to come as a helpless baby, but he's going to come in power. And so for you today, you have to make a decision. How will he find you when he returns in power? Will you know him as your Savior and as your Lord? Will you see the power and know that that power is what saves you and what will bring you into eternity with him? Or will that power scare you because you know that you have not trusted in him? Will that power you know lead to, well, because you didn't accept him, lead to a very undesirable end to your life? See, that's what's presented before us today. We have to make a decision who this Jesus is. And my hope is is that you haven't made up your mind about him on your own or from maybe other people, but you have investigated it for yourself, that you have investigated him and can see through the prophecies and through the scripture that he is who he said he was and who he is. I want to ask you to pray with me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we, we thank you so much for your son and we thank you that you sent him. God, in that that you didn't forget about us, that you kept your promise, that you found a way to reconcile us with you. And that's really what the Christmas story is about. It's, it's not about Christmas trees and, and all of the other stuff that happens around Christmas, God. The story is really a story of reconciliation, that you have provided a door for us to be able to walk through and to be able to find forgiveness and redemption. And Father, we thank you for that gift. And God, I, today I pray for those who are listening to this message, God, that, that they would truly understand in their hearts who you are to them. You know, God, I, I, I think of those today who maybe have never put their faith in Jesus. And God, I pray that they wouldn't allow the world to tell them who Jesus is, that they maybe even wouldn't allow their own, their, their own voice and their own head, God, to tell them, but God, that they would look honestly and truthfully at the evidence that's before them about who Jesus is. And you know, God, I also pray for those who already know Jesus, and yet, God, so often we've created a false Jesus. Father, maybe it's a Jesus that, that is a Savior, but not a Lord. And God, I just pray that you would help us to realize that, indeed, we have, when we accept Jesus, we have to accept all of you, all of you and what he means in our life. So God, here in these next few moments and And in our lives, God, as we have days, weeks, months, even years ahead, whatever it is that you've decided, God, that we would give our lives over to you. And Father, that we would realize that you have saved us and that you love us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So as I wrap things up here today, we've learned in the story that there is God's upper story, right? We've learned that over these first 21 or so weeks. And God is writing this amazing story. We look at the Old Testament, we wonder, what what is God doing? Well, now we're starting to see what he was doing. Now that Jesus has arrived, he wants us to have a right right relationship with him. So here's what I want to challenge you to do as I leave you. Swallow your pride. Swallow your pride. Just admit it. Admit that you've blown it. (laughs) I admit that every day, that over and over again I've blown it. I have to admit, I'm a chief of sinners. And then what I do is I turn it over to God. And that's my challenge to you is to admit that you've blown it, that you've sinned, but that you'll repent, that you'll repent before God and that you will accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. And today could be that day for you, the day when you do that. I want to invite you to make that decision. And if you want to make that decision today, I want to invite you as well to to let me know about it, to let our church know about it. You can let us know that by sending us an email. You can send me an email at, at dberry at cambridgecitychristianchurch.org. And I'd like to know what God's doing in your life and like to know of the decision that you've made as a result of this message today. May God bless you, and may God continue to walk with you in his glory and his grace.